This is the English Wine Collection's Wine Talks podcast. My name is Guy Hayward, and in this episode, I chat with Abby Wright, who's been a key influencer in the spa industry. In 2008, she launched her dynamic spa marketing and booking platform, SpaBreaks.com. From being a startup in the industry to becoming the market leader, she says that the key to her success has been her determination to open up the spa industry to everyone. Abby talks about how she embraces a modern approach to running a business, a mindset that developed in part from her own experiences becoming a mother at the same time as starting SpaBreaks.com. She talks candidly about the work-life juggling act that comes with being a working mother and how she achieved this. Chatting to Abby at her home in Berkshire in the company of her lovely spaniel, who for part of the recording you may just hear a panting in the background, we talked about her journey, the role of spa industry in the modern society, and of course, we touch on a few of her wine stories too. Abby! Hi! Thank you very much for, for being on board and part of the English Wine Collection's Wine Talks. To uh, get things going, could you give us a rundown of your career to where you are now? Okay, um, right. So if I go back to uh, university, I guess it's probably the best place. Sure, yeah. So uh, I studied um, communication media studies, uh, did a journalism postgraduate at Cardiff before um, following what I thought was the career that I wanted at the time, which was into journalism. So for um, my year, my first year out of university, I worked for a news agency in a small town called Hungerford, just outside of, um, of Newbury. And uh, for a year, I wrote um, heartbreaking interviews and articles for women's magazines around every subject title you could think, from women who'd lost their children to hanging themselves on their bedroom curtains, to women whose husbands turned out to be serial killers, to just about every depressing story you can imagine. That's um, intense. It was pretty intense. <laughs> and what do you know what I remember the most from those days was that we didn't have... I used to have to drive around the country in the little agency um, KA car, which really had no brakes and didn't work. Plus, to add to that, I was going to places I'd never been before, and there weren't Google Maps. So I was having to... I'd have to plan my journey the day before with all the little A5... Um, kind of ordinance maps and I'd have to work out from which page and post-it notes went in from one region to another to another and I remember one trip it took me 21 different maps to get to this place so at 90 and 21 years of age in my first role interviewing people in pretty heroic uh, harrowing um, scenarios it was daunting to say the least so that was a great grounder for me I think and probably really set me on the road to being a very um, assertive and ambitious individual who thought, right, this really isn't for me. So um, knowing that I had quite a creative flair for turning things into a positive, I took the writing um, skills, I guess, and, and certainly the marketing skills that I felt I had and went, followed a career in marketing. So um, I went from there to and had a sh short stint at Porsche, where um, I really didn't like the culture of the place I was working, so moved from there. And at that point, 9-11 um, had just happened. And I started working for an amazing company who basically did maritime security. So they worked out if somebody could fly a plane into a building in New York, which is exactly what happened, somebody could drive a very large cruise liner into the middle of Venice, for example. So I started working on the marketing team for them and traveled the world working in ports around the world, including um, in Venice, uh, where I worked for about six months. And we did a whole load of security um, systems and processes to counter what was happening. Really fascinating, really interesting. Something I knew nothing about, but was great life experience. And I think built part of who I am today to to kind of have that grit to keep on going so what from, was fascinating about it what um, did you really enjoy I think just the fact that actually it was a world I knew nothing about so I was literally learning every day that I was there about you know all the different courses that the the, the staff the, the sailors basically or the crew had to go on all the security around what was happening at port side so I was able to do security audits and, and make sure and have a look at you know what security systems were in place we did all the underwater sonars and security systems so that actually 
in the ports where the, the ship comes up to the side of the port, there's all these amazing technological devices underneath that basically are able to, to tell somebody somewhere sat in a tower how fast that ship's coming in, where it's going to finish, how quickly they need to slow down, all those incredible things that I... I truly had no idea. So you get a heads up whether it was coming in too fast and exactly. it was going to... Okay. And so they could automatically, they then install things that came up from the the ground so that, you know, if it was coming too fast, they'd put this metal wow. sheet in that would come up. Just things that you would never even... No, and I, yeah. I think it's important to note at this point, I grew up in a very sleepy seaside town in Devon. You know, the most exciting thing that I ever did was was buy an ice cream with two lumps of ice cream on it rather than one. So it, it you know, my my family are from very very average backgrounds. I was the first to go to university. It, it just to me doing this, it, being in this world was something that I never dreamt of, and I think therefore made it even the more exciting at that age. I had translators travelling with me, and we were doing all sorts of crazy things and visiting amazing places. So. It's a really fun time. Really Were you happy part of any this. test projects within that? Did you get to see any explosions? Venice or... um, was the big one. I didn't see any explosions. Which is a can real we give it shame, a go, please? But it's like, oh, please, can we just press that button? No, I mean, don't press the red button. Um, but it certainly, um, you know, the, the camaraderie, I think, around that time, I met a number of people who had come in from the forces, which was quite interesting. Um, and one of those guys actually sadly went to, to he got, blown up in um, Kabul um, was in one of the tanks at the time so met some really interesting people from interesting backgrounds and just opened my eyes I guess to a world that I just hadn't been hadn't been privy to and, and was really excited by newness newness and I think probably the world changing which at that point it really was so from there um, traveling was great however the our headquarters was actually the HMS Wellington in on um, the embankment. So I'd have to travel from Newbury up to London and it just became a bit difficult after four or five years in the traveling. And at that point I wanted to settle down a bit more and, and kind of do the things that a mid, like girl in her mid twenties did. So I then found a fantastic role um, at a local collection of hotels called the Donington Valley Hotel, Vineyard at Stock Cross, which was ultimately called the Peter Michael Collection. So Peter um, Michael, founded and started Classic FM. He also owned an incredible winery over in Napa. Um, so he was, uh, he opened these beautiful hotels that had always been known to me as a local now in Berkshire. Um, and I had the opportunity to go in and, and do their PR and marketing for them um, for a while. Went in at a very junior level and just, I think probably from my tourism background growing up in Devon, was just enamored by this collection of beautiful, beautiful hotels, spas, golf courses, and wineries, which kind of created this, this perfect package. Um, and it was while we were at, or I was at Peter Michael, the People's Michael collection, that we opened or created and dug basically a spa from scratch. Um, and it was, uh, I think it was a six million pound project. And I was there from the very first spade that went into the ground and through the whole process and really it was while I was at the Peter Michael collection that the ideas for sparbreaks.com started to form and okay. become born. I wanted to, I'm really glad you brought that one up actually because um, uh, I noticed as you say that they have quite an impressive wine cellar there. They so do. Did you have a, a route around or, or have a look at any of the bottles? I sampled or... a fair few as well, Guy, if I'm honest. Good. No, yes. no, please do. Head can you, can you remember any of them in particular? Or... <laughs> Not really. All I remember, and, and again, I've, I've never really been in the world of wine and, and fine food, but at the time that I was there, the, the restaurant had two Michelin stars. Yeah. And um, this unbelievable wine cellar and I all I remember is being lucky enough to go out to Napa and to do a bit of a wine tour around California and realizing that actually I really liked the big ballsy Californian Chardonnays which a lot of people didn't like but but actually I really love them and that caramel smoothness that I just adored so all of Sir Peter's wines were incredible and um, have been drunk by many a, an American president in the past so wow. it was a fantastic round in a learning base for me really to be able to get a handle for fine wine and food and it was an area that was 
very pleasant and entertaining journalists and food critics um sounds blissful a, i know it's such a hard job <laughs> but um it was it was brilliant it was fabulous so moving on from there then what led you to starting spa breaks what was the, the step so while i was at uh donnington the vineyard I managed the third party relationships that existed at the time. Now this was 16, 17 years ago. And at the time there was only really lastminute.com and Spa Break Direct um, that existed. And I managed both of the relationships and they were doing a fabulous job in their own right. Um, because at that point Spa was literally on the brink of exploding. You know, if you didn't have a spa, you were building one. If you had one, you were making it better. Um, and you, it really became the reason for people to go to hotels in the UK. Um, so it was at this time where everything was just starting to boom. Donington, the process of watching a spa go from literally a spade into a ground until to choosing what tiles to put, what wet facilities, what product houses to put in, and being involved with that for three or four or five years was just wonderful. Um, and I think it really gave me a flavour and I guess the, the inspiration for what I felt was missing in the industry. Um, at the time, all that was happening, obviously the group on the Wouchers, the Treat or the Wahondas at the time that was, were all going down the kind of cheap, commoditized type option of, you know, quick and easy treatments and, and sort of nice throw and away cheap. Option. exactly the mob yeah. deal kind of you know 50 percent off buy one get one free type model um but actually as we spent more and more time and i spent more and more time in the spa at donnington i think it just dawned on me that actually it wasn't about cheap and it wasn't about quick and we were sitting on something that was really quite powerful in the fact that actually for from a spa point of view if you take spa back to its origins, it's a million miles away from quick and cheap and nasty. It's it's more about recovery, recuperation, and, and really taking time out, uh, uh, which is what I felt was completely missing. So I literally kind of thought, right, they're, they're, they're doing a good job, but it's not a job that necessarily I think is, is where this industry is going to go. Um, and really at that point, it was my vision to create create I guess because commercially while while we think about that as well at the same time I was in house which meant I had the constant um battle between my general manager of the hotel saying Abby I want all this spa business to come direct I don't want to use third parties mm -hmm. but then you've got a third party like lastminute.com going look I've got three million people set on my database you're never going to reach these people you need to pay us commission so this constant kind of internal battle between third party versus direct played on my mind a lot because it formed part of my every day um, trying to say well if we do this with them then we'll get this exposure yeah but if we did a flyer to all of our database couldn't we get the same and it was those constant kind of reinforcing of messages that thought I that made me think right there is a there is a space here to create what a, a version of a third party that ultimately complements spa's own business strategy rather than compromises them and makes them kind of uncomfortable with with the working scenario um and that's what i really set out to do i wanted something that was a real recommendation service so again there was a lot around the voucher model where you redeem direct but actually there was never an opportunity you know never a chance that you'd get in because they'd oversubscribe so many and you'd never get the time you wanted or the date you wanted, wanted so what do you mean by a, a recommendation service, as in you'd send people or yeah, so we have uh, in sparbreaks.com now. So when I started the business back in 2007, we had two um, placement students from university. But I always wanted an element of call centre. In a world where everything else was vouchers and redeeming direct, I wanted to be able to offer our customers the opportunity to be able to pick up the phone to us and say, right, this is my requirement. What do you recommend? Okay. I don't like chintzy decoration, for example. Can you recommend somewhere really modern? Can you recommend somewhere that's, um, you know, that's got an outdoor pool, for example? Now, all that stuff wasn't easy to do unless you picked up the phone and spoke to somebody. No, of course. So I always wanted to do that. So worked hard to build that. We're now a um, call center of 55 spa gurus, as we call them, who are literally 
trained on every single spa on our website to ensure that they are able to recommend the right spa for the right person for the right occasion because let's face it we all go to spas for different things yeah of course so the, it's the the core team network and the, and the train that everyone's got that you think is key and that's, that's so what makes us different i think it's you know we have a customer service team of 12 so they're there seven days a week to be able to help both our suppliers and our customers um with any issues that they have. That that post and pre-booking kind of care is, I believe, more important than ever in a world where people are quite quick to go to Twitter if there's something wrong or moan on Facebook and all sure, that kind sure. of stuff. So yeah. having those channels of communication was really important. Um, the spa gurus in the, in the call center are literally trained. So every Wednesday afternoon, we have an open door policy whereby one of our spas comes in every week to train the team on how to sell their spa what USPs they've got, show some photos. Every weekend we have at least six of our agents going out to visit spas so that actually they're going around the country. We cover their travel for them so that they're actually getting a feel for what they're selling, being able to bring that experience to life when they speak to the customer, which in my eyes, in a world where everything is going so impersonal, was really, really, really important. Yeah, it's an interesting point there. As you say, you're, you're keeping it very relevant, close to the customers, close to yourselves, and then it's that communication between you all. Definitely. Okay, so if we stick to when you first started Spa Breaks, I've got to hear that at the time you had your first child. I, I did. three months yeah, old, is that was, right? Yeah, I how started. Was, how was that work-life balance? Um, I mean, that, that's full on. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was. So I, I started in the March. Freddie was born on the 27th of January of the same year. So he was, what, probably 10 weeks old. Um, and I'd taken two years out from working at Donington to start in the business and set up my own PR company in that time to be able to really do the market research that I needed to make sure that I'd done to set up spa breaks in the right way. So I was working with a number of um, hotels and spas at that time almost kind of infiltrating them to try and get a feel for what I needed spa breaks to be to make it work. I then also had a network of 26 spas to start with when I opened the doors in, in March 2007. So it okay. kind of all tied in quite nicely. You were very sort of set up then really. It, it was the kind of set up. I was yeah. kind of already there and knowing what I wanted to do. And um, obviously I was very lucky in that I had Ross and, and Ross Marshall and Andrew Harding, my two business partners who had already done something similar with Your God Travel understood the synergy between the two and, and really allowed me to to run free with this idea of where I wanted to take sparbreaks.com away from being a traditional third party. And so, yeah, we literally started with the two placement, placement students. And um, I was very lucky, I guess, from an early stage in that because I lived a two and a half hour commute away each way, there was always limits on what I was going to be able to do. Plus, having a child, obviously, at the time made that all the more complicated. Of course, yeah. um, But what I hope is that actually what's come through from that is I'm very, very embracing of um, remote working and being mm. able to embrace welcoming women into the fold who I feel generally cannot get back into work once they've had children. It's very difficult, to, I feel, to get back into work Um once you've had a child, if you don't work with flexible and understanding employers, because it just, it, it's it's very, very difficult to juggle. I've subsequently gone on to have two more children since then. So all three of them have been born since the business has started. Um, and it, without nannies and oodles of childcare and lots of winging it in many ways and a fantastic network of friends, it just, it, it just would have been impossible. So I've been very lucky that I could be flexible. Um, so you've adapted in a sense, haven't you? It's how you can I manage do. it all, fit it yeah, in. I do. Yeah. And actually each phase of the children's lives creates its own different challenges. You know, actually at the time you don't realise it, but when your children are preschool age, it's actually much easier to work because you put them into nursery at 8 a.m. or you have a nanny and you don't pick them up to 6 p.m. And actually your working day is great. That's... 300 days a year because the the nurseries are open through school holidays and you don't have to worry about it your first child then starts school and it's like oh my goodness I've now got six weeks in the summer to deal with I've got inset days I've got sickness I've got 
all sorts of things to contend with. I've got to pick up at half past three, I've got to drop off at nine. Suddenly your eight to six working day becomes you know, 9.30 to, to three o'clock. And then in the evenings they go to bed later. So I used to put my little one to bed and I'd be able to start working again at seven o'clock, for example. So I could be mum from five to seven. I'd log back on at seven o'clock and I'd work right the way through till 11. But when they're older, I was, yeah, exactly, I was kind of shifted hats. But when they get older, they then have homework to do and they have spellings to do and they have reading to do. And suddenly the bedtime gets a bit later and half past seven, eight o'clock. So by the time you've had some dinner, it's nine o'clock and you're exhausted because you've got children and therefore you can't keep going. So you're constantly as a working mum having to evolve the way you work to make it work for you. And, and I don't think there's anybody in this world that can judge any other woman on how they choose to do that all i know is that the more money you have the easier it is and uh i think you know if i was to get on my soapbox about the press that's the one thing that upsets me a lot about the press in the fact that they don't represent real working women it's more glamorous working women who have millions in the bank and an army of people to help run their lives and that really is not the case for the majority of us working women i think what you've you've touched on there from your own experience is key as you say it's a question of Right, let's get on with this. Let's do it. I'm going to go Just to work. Go I'm going to be a mum. I'm I'm all hands yeah. on deck, as it were. Which... Definitely. But things things I think get compromised as a result of that, and that's the thing you've got to you've got to be aware of. So, what do you think got compromised? Me, actually, my health and me, okay. and I think you you strive for a career and a business and a company and a a workplace it's so happy and so content and so functional and you strive this for the same for your family at home so the children are all fine and they're not they're not being sacrificed in any way because you spend every minute when you're not in the office with them and they're all fine so actually it was my friends and it was my personal I guess social um, network that suffered because you just get lost somewhere in between and you don't keep fit and you don't look after yourself and you don't necessarily listen to your emotional and physical needs during that time because you're so worried about the two parties and making sure they're working that you get kind of forgotten in the middle. I think that shows a, a determination and commitment though to what you're doing. You say you're being your mum, you're being your businesswoman and you're just cracking on and it's kind of like blinkered to anything else, Definitely. I'm just going to get you've this got to, done. You, you can't think about it and you and literally if I think back now it's been 11 years and I can honestly say to you, I haven't been able to think about it. When If you do think about it, it upsets you too much. So don't because the stop guilt, mentality, don't isn't stop. it? So just, just keep going, keep going, keep going, yeah, keep yeah, going. Yeah. Next year, next month, next week, next campaign, oh. next, next gifting birthday. season, whatever it is, <laughs> just keep going and just keep smiling because ultimately there's nothing more you can do. Don't moan about something you can't change. At the time, I haven't been able to change it for the last seven years. I knew I had to do it and I knew what I wanted to achieve out of it. So I just had to keep pushing. Definitely. So, on the back of this, it sounds like you're very deserving of going to some wonderful spas. <sighs> no doubt you have. I'm, I, I hope you have. <laughs> Do any come spring to mind? Any come to mind? You're like, yeah, that was that was a wonderful spa break. I sadly haven't been to as many as I would love to go to, and I think probably. The fact that I have children prevents me doing that. And exactly what we were just saying earlier, for the last 11 years, I could literally have been in a spa every weekend for forever because they're there and they're, they're available for me to try. However, because of my split between work and children, my weekend time is precious with, with the kids. And sadly, sure. children and spas don't mix very well. <laughs> um, and therefore, um, I wouldn't inflict my three children on any of the spas I work with because no it'd be far pen. too embarrassing. No, exactly. <laughs> um, and I can't leave them at home with the dog. So um, I have to leave that to my team of very, very, um, very capable product ladies who are out on the road every day of every week, meeting with our spas, um, checking the spas are, are of a level that are adequate to be on our site, sure. making sure that we're upholding standards, making sure they're delivering on everything they, they need to deliver on. Um, and really making sure that we are out there advising all of our spas because we advise our spas as much as we advise our customers. We know what our customers want and therefore we can tell the spas what they need to give us to sell, basically. But um, for you, what it has there been more? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a massive 
I'm a massive believer that you go to spas for different reasons and there's yeah. different spas for different times of your life. I am a, a, a absolute Penny Hill Power Park fan. I okay. love the facilities. I love the space that it produces. But I, if I had to pick a favourite, it would be Galgorm over in Northern Ireland. And the reason for that is I think growing up near water, um, I am a massive advocate and fan of, of nature and being outside and I try soothing, very hard it? it's very soothing yeah. very healing very very relaxing for me the sound of water instantly takes me to a, a different place and Galbagorm have done an incredible job of basically making the outside part of the spa and part of the experience and it is absolutely breathtaking um, it's one of my favourites in, in um, the UK and Ireland Sounds wonderful. It is. <laughs> so, Abby, you've been quoted as a, make sure I get this right, as a disruptor <laughs> in the spa industry. What do you, I mean, what do you make of that? What does, what does that mean to you? Uh, I love it. And um, I think the more I get hear, heard as um, somebody said the other day that we challenge the status quo of the spa industry, we push boundaries we break barriers we disrupt we we do everything that um probably a lot of people would think is not particularly helpful but where i do think it's been helpful in the spa industry is that the spa industry has evolved in the last 11 years beyond beyond all recognition and it would have been very dangerous for us as an industry to remain where we were 10 or 11 years ago where spa was all about beauty and was all about affluent beautiful women being able to sit in a spa on a tuesday afternoon when they've got nothing else better to do sure that in its very superficial form is is absolutely what spas can offer people but there is also a lot more absolutely yeah you know and there's nothing to say that's not a brilliant thing and, and and great if you can have the lifestyle to do that however spa had to become more accessible whether that's from a an affordability point of view an accessibility point of view a location point of view um the just the, the chance of choice and the, be able to have options we had to open it up in many many facets and i would hope that sparbreaks.com and my team and i have done that over the years and and hopefully are now starting to get recognized for it so what do you think are the most important changes within the industry that, that's happened or that you guys have, have had an impact on? I think that the, the biggest one that I'm, I'm most proud of is certainly the, um, the movement to encourage people with cancer into the spa, uh, spa okay. world. Um, years and years ago, eight years ago probably now, my, um, my mobile phone rang one Sunday morning and it was a customer and they basically were crying and crying and crying on the end of the phone. And to cut a long story short, basically we'd sent them to the spa. They hadn't told us they had cancer. They turned up to their treatment on the Sunday morning and probably a very hungover 18 year old had seen that they ticked the box on the consultation form and, and literally said, quote unquote, I, I can't touch you with the bar to I'm really sorry. We can't do this treatment. Oh yeah. Um, and it was really that it was an absolute light bulb moment of right. I cannot allow this to happen. And and I worked with the team and the spas that we that we, we worked with at the time. And this was back in the early days. And and we basically created what we coined at the time the recovery retreats program. And we just worked with spas that we knew and and respected to be able to at least offer our customers somewhere to go, safe in the knowledge that that wouldn't happen again. Now, things have changed beyond, you know, beyond um, kind of recognition since then. And, and there's a number of very strong women in our industry who have been instrumental in making this change. Um, and, you know, the likes of Amanda Barlow, Jennifer Young, Michelle Hammond, Julie Back. There's been some absolutely phenomenal um, work done to ensure that... Um, to ensure that this isn't the case anymore. Um, and now we're in a position where actually it's, it's, it's almost becoming the norm. I wouldn't say it's, it's everywhere and it's, it's you know, we, we haven't got an issue anymore because there are still pockets of, of our spas that just still do not, in my eyes, um, stand up or do what they should do in this area. But it's certainly getting a lot better. Do you think that, um, I suppose a lot of the locations that spas are in can help with that? It's all part of the, 
the overall ambiance that someone can pick up on. Is there anything else that they can do to add to that? I mean, is it is about making it more of a, a stay, should we say, for longer? From a cancer point of view or a general point of view? From a general point of view, I think if, if spas can contribute uh, as part of somebody's well-being and, and an overall improvement in one's health, should we say? Definitely. I mean, we, we I was talking to somebody the other day who's in the financial private equity world and... I explained to him that I feel we're in an incredibly powerful situation in our industry. The beauty industry, um, and if we we coin it as the beauty and wellness industry, because actually it's it's more than just the beauty industry, but we are in a position of power right now. And in a world where everything is so uncertain and so bleak in many ways around Brexit and everything that's happening, the beauty and wellness industry is still able to make people feel better about themselves. You know, when the recession hit, women bought more lipsticks. It's all very basic, but it's very true. And actually, ours is the only industry that continues to grow when economic um, crisis is hit. And we see it every time when everything, you know, when anything's a little bit bit rocky economically or, you know, culturally or socially, people turn to their own physical well-being and, and their appearance and everything. And that will never change in my belief. And therefore, from our point of view, we as an industry hold the key to being able to really unlock happiness for people and that release that everybody needs from a world which is, let's face it, is only going to get worse as social media continues and in this domination around the need for information and the need for things much more quickly. The beauty industry remains the industry where people can literally escape and just... Um, retreat from everything and I, I personally feel that's incredibly powerful. I think that w- what you've touched on there is key to as you say bringing everybody's um, wellness to get um, back to a centre if you like and to be feeling better and I noticed that a, so a lot of the spas they don't just focus on the treatment sides it's, it, re- it almost is like you can go and, well you can go and stay at these places now and you have a wonderful hotel with it and treatments but also food is quite important when you're at these destinations. And dare I say it, wine can obviously Definitely. help. Um, is a wonderful, it's a massive part. Well, it's all pairing. It's, it's, it's it consumption. Is. Do you think that some of the spas are shifting more towards that? And so it can be a, a, a sort of a total escape, if you like. It's not just a, a treatment for a day. It's a come and stay. We'll look after you and... Have you come across any that are doing that now that you can speak about? or Definitely. I mean, it, it, the, our business has become an experiential business. The world, particularly the millennials, millennials are wanting to buy experiences. And at sparbreaks.com, we've very early on recognised that the majority of people that come and use us are on a special occasion so it's a big birthday it's an anniversary it's a baby moon it's a honeymoon it's a pre-baby moon it's a you know it's a it's a divorce party it's a hen party it's a whatever it may be it's a reason to get together and therefore experiences by their very nature contain a number of different components and our most successful spa packages on sparbreaks.com are those that contain an element of food and beverage Afternoon tea has become incredibly popular over the last few years. Um, So our packages with afternoon tea combined with spa, use of facilities, a nice swim, the grounds, for example, of of some of our beautiful country houses are our most popular packages by far. And then every package um, that sells incredibly well on our site always has an element of, of food and beverage and wine. And we, we can't get away from it. You know, the, the most successful promotions we do on our site generally involve a, a glass of warm pims in the winter or Prosecco or a gin in, in the summer. And and actually that glass of bubbly and being able to, I guess, complete your experience with making sure that you are having time out with loved ones because let's face it the reason you go on a spa break is generally to spend time with people you don't get the chance to spend it with normally and being able to eat beautiful food and drink fantastic wine or proseccos or cocktails just only builds to that experience And, and we need to be very aware of the fact that actually spa is becoming experiential and it's in its very right 
so how, how do you see things progressing forward from here within that if there is going to be more of an interplay between food the wine the hospitality the spa treatments where do you think the industry can go for me it's all about um luckily i started this conversation by talking about the, the kind of the mob deals around the cheap, the quick and the easy. Yeah. It's come full circle. And what's what's helped me a lot is that actually people have been burnt using those kind of deals before and have actually realised that in this industry you get what you pay for. And ultimately we have seen record years in 2018 for a number of high, our high-end spas, including Penny Hill Park, Rudding Park, a new spa that opened um, up in Harrogate, the Corinthia in London, all high-end spas that have a very high basket value for their packages. And they've all had record years. Our customers are wanting that bit extra now. They're happy to pay that bit extra if they're getting the experience they want. And the increase in two night stays, three night stays, is also a trend that we're seeing, probably thanks to Brexit, if we're honest. And, and the fact that actually more people are wanting to stay in the UK and Ireland and travel around our own country and explore more of what we have here. Um, we're able to harness and, and really embrace that and be able to offer two, three night stays, which include even more elements of F&B, even more elements of, of treatments and, and also added elements. We're just about to launch our um, a brand new high-end collection called the Elysian Collection, which will showcase everything that I believe there is to celebrate around the high-end five-star UK spa industry. Um, we, as a as a society, I don't think do enough to celebrate the the high-end market. We always talk a lot about the cheap and the 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 kind of the low end, but actually nobody's talking about the real gems that are out there that people just haven't even found yet and for us this bucket list of spas where you can come back to every special occasion and go right i went to this spa last time uh, where am i going to go next time what what amazing packages are out there they're going to be packages that i believe push the boundaries again they're more creative our industry has been conditioned for a long time around price point and believing that nobody will pay more than 99 pound per person because that's what the mob deal said that it would that they would that's rubbish actually if you position it in the correct way and create packages and experiences that are truly um, worth the money people will absolutely spend them so we're going to push the boundaries again and really launch this this kind of collection of incredible spa experiences that can't be bought anywhere else and really really make that special occasion truly very special and and that for me is the future of, of where we're going with the spa industry. It sounds like what you're saying is you need to make sure people are given the right information that they can find it and then they can absorb that, make an informed decision on where they're going. Do you think, uh, again, talking about the future of the, the spa industry and what you guys are doing, do, um, do you get many bookings from men? I mean, the, the males are involved or is it still a very much a female um, industry? No, not as much at all. In fact, actually, if you look at the traffic that comes to our site, it is almost a 50 50 split between men and women who are actually visiting oh, wow. our that, site. Oh, that even? Okay. It is that even. And it's why we've never gone down the pink, pink and fluffy um, kind of line with our design and our, our templates because actually it is as much about men. Um, and even if it's been the lady in his ear kind of pointing him in the right direction to find us then ultimately it is men <laughs> booking for special occasions and if if it's not if it's a woman booking it's generally for her mother or her sister or her husband or a partner or a friend and and therefore there is almost this 50 50 split of people going and attending and and men i think are much more open these days to going to the, the spa experiences there's fantastic gyms in a lot of our our spas there's fantastic um, fitness classes that they can attend um there's running tracks there's there's all sorts of things there's golf obviously spa and golf the synergy between those two is is immense um so there are a lot of elements of spa away from the traditional spa day of, of having a, a facial and and you know wearing pink fluffy slippers that actually is is a fantastic experience for men at the same time i think what you've touched on those key as you said it's, it's more about an experience and it's not just the come and do the nails or just sit and have a chat it is 
Come and stay for the weekend, have a great time, luxuriate yourself, and we'll have some nice food, and then hopefully some nice wine as well, if that does fit in. Always. Which leads me very well onto the next question of, do you think that can integrate within, within the spa market? As you say, if people are, or rather the industry is heading towards this stay culture, do you think wine could be a part of that? English wine, obviously. <laughs> Especially English wine. <laughs> um, most definitely. I mean, I think I think I would love to say that probably ninety eight percent of anyone that goes on a spa break doesn't have an element of wine or alcohol at some point during their stay. I think we are a million miles away from being the culture in the nation that goes on a spa break to eat a lettuce leaf and, and not have a glass of wine and not maybe take a, bo- a box of chocolates with you to eat in the room and, and not it want to indulge. It? it really does. Yeah. I cannot think of anything worse. And and that's why we don't go down that very, very strict detox kind of uh, traditional sense of, of what I guess people thought health spas were in the past because things again have moved on so much from then that it's just not about that anymore. You can enjoy all those lovely things while looking after your well-being and your your physical and emotional health while taking time out with loved ones and having a glass of English wine. So if we stay on the topic of wine, for, for obvious reasons, do you have a favourite wine? Is there something that's really stuck out to you? Um, or a wine story, as we say. Not really. I guess during my time at the vineyard, I, I got to try so many um, that it kind of bamboozled me a little bit. I love dessert wines, which people find quite okay. bizarre. Um, I no, love no, dessert wines are lovely. They are yeah. absolutely scrumptious, yeah. and particularly with some of the chocolate desserts that the, the chef used to do at, um, at the vineyard were, were quite incredible. So I'm I'm a real sweet kind of sweet tooth, I think, and anything that goes with puddings or cheese ports and sherries and just that's my absolute favorite but then i i have to say i'm i'm a big gin fan as well so for me big long cold gin and tonics are um are my thing at the moment but uh, though I, I can honestly say to you that i don't think there'll ever be a day when there isn't a form of wine or or cocktail included with our packages because it's what people want I think it's all part of the experience, isn't it? It's uh, Definitely. which stage they are on the uh, break, as it were, as to when it happens. So, Abby, you've you've won many awards, including most recently, I'll make sure I get this right, the Every uh, Woman in Travel Entrepreneur Trophy last November. So that's right, isn't it? It was, yeah. November before last. Thank you. Was, wasn't it? Yeah. What, what, what did this mean to you, you know, being an entrepreneur and then getting the recognition for the work that you've done? Uh, uh, how does that feel? I think I've been very lucky in that uh, we've won a number of awards over the years. Um, and although my name's on the award, it actually is is not excluded from the fact that the whole team have earned those awards. I think over the years, it's become more and more obvious to me that you have to surround yourself by people you trust, who get you, who understand your motivations, who I guess want to go in the same direction as you. And once you've found those people, making dreams come true and making ambitions and and achieving things becomes very, very easy because they buy into all the same things that you buy into. And ultimately you're just one massive driver rather than one person trying to do it on their own. So the awards, although have my name on it, are, are really for my team. The, the thing that personally they do for me is, um, and this is something that I, I believe very strongly in, is that it just shows that you can absolutely achieve anything. I, I came from the most, most average of backgrounds and haven't had the private school boat education and haven't had the, the kind of the, the golden spoon opportunities that a lot of people have had. What I have had is the opportunity to work, as I said, with amazing people who just got what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it and aided me and and absolutely kind of invested in everything that we were doing. 
and had ideas and had observations and helped kind of drive this ongoing snowball of, of effective of making something highly highly successful and ultimately if if I can do it then truly anybody can and I think that's the beauty of these awards you know for my children it makes it very it makes it exciting for them because actually mummy is a role model and mummy is somebody that doesn't just disappear for half the week to go to work and suddenly it brings it all into context for them and they understand why we're doing it and when your son who's now 11, comes home from school and my mummy, we had to, to write a project today about um, our heroes and, and I put that you were my hero and when everybody Googled you at, at work, in school today in the library, um, they all found your photos and even I was in one of the photos and, and when you hear <laughs> things like that from an 11 year old who literally was three weeks old when you started something to actually being named in his school project as, as one of his heroes, it just absolutely says it all and and that is really what the awards do for me is it reinforces the fact that those decisions I made 15 16 years ago were were the right ones and and we as a result have created a business that is able to send 7,000 people every week to spas around the UK and you know it's um we've we've fought some good causes along the way so it's been a a good journey I think that's that's a wonderful um way to wrap up and also just to say that you've got the acknowledgement from your children you're doing well <laughs> doing all right <laughs> mum's mom, cool mom, you're doing yes. well <laughs> abby absolutely brilliant thank you so much my pleasure thank, thank you, you guys <laughs>